So to start off, um, so we've decided to do the claim session because we often get a lot of questions around claim scenarios, what a claim could cost, um, is, the legis is there legislation that could hold a person responsible for cleanup? So today um, we've decided to do this so that we can inform you guys about all the necessary stuff involved in the claim. So to start off, let's introduce you to the team. So our environmental product champ is James Price. He couldn't join us today, but he's our product head and he runs with our environmental stuff. Then this is me, Chrisanne. I'm the specialist underwriter for the trucking side. Then we have Sherry Howell, who's our newest recruit. And we're so excited that she's joined us. Shelly plays a role as a business development um, person within the team, and she's the face that you all will be seeing very often. We've got Sipa and Alex on our claim side. Sipa is the senior claim specialist. Alex is the claim specialist that assists us. And then we've got our secret weapon, Dwayne Pretorius, who's our loss adjuster. And he's from EFI Global and plays a role as a senior environmental specialist. So Dwayne is our, our special, um, our secret weapon, and he's also got the guns to prove. <laughs> so thank you so much, Dwayne, for joining us today and for making the time uh, to share with our brokers. So Dwayne's going to chat to us today about the processes that he's mandated to do on behalf of IT during an emergency spill claim. And he's going to chat to us a little bit about legislation around the schools and who may be legally liable. Um, so, Duane, over to you. Thank you very much, Kersan. Um, I'm going to just share my screen. Have you stopped sharing your screen, eh? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> oh, good morning, everyone. My name is Dwayne Pretorius. I'm the Senior Environmental Specialist for EFI Global South Africa, which is a division of Sedgwick South Africa. Sedgwick South Africa is the largest loss adjusting firm in the world and has got over 65 branches internationally. But enough about Sedgwick and EFI, a little bit more about something that I'm extremely passionate about, which is environmental claim management. Um, I've been in the industry for way over 20 years. I've been a contractor and a service provider myself in the environmental cleanup game for way over 10 years. Been a consultant, assessor, and also a project environmental project manager um, in the industry for way over 10 years as well. So <coughs> let's start my presentation. Can everybody see my screen? We can. Wonderful. Yes. Great. So, um, so. As Grisan said, I manage all IT <sighs> incidents. Anything from, can I just please ask that you can mute your mic for me? I hear some background noises. Thank you very much. Okay, so I've been managing um, IT claims for close to two years. Um, anything from a small spill to a large spill, any spill in general, not just moving movable assets incidents, but also static incidents and also um, gradual releases from various incidents that uh, we managed in the past. But just to give you a quick overview of what EFI International um, can assist anyone with, um, irrespective if you're in the US, the UK, Europe, Australia, or South America, we are specialists in site assessments and remediation, third party review and data verification of environmental incidents, brownfield and site development um, plans for environmental projects, regulatory compliance, indoor air quality, wetlands and biological petroleum management incidents, industrial hygiene, occupational in and industrial safety, asbestos and lead assessments, and remediation oversight and monitoring. So we're going to go a little bit more through our services in, in just, I would say, about two minutes. Just looking at wide over from a road incident, environmental management incident point of view, we do the incident and claim assessment. So all consultation can only start once an incident assessment has been conducted. Then thereafter we consult. So from a continuous consultation and environmental claims point of view, we do consultation. 
pollution and related or, or related claims of that incident, specific incident, operational and safety management, and complex and of complex and large claims and projects. So that that in a nutshell, we do assessments, we do consultation, and also project management of that incident for on behalf of I2 and their incidents. A little bit more about EFI Global. Uh, EFI Global Environmental SA strive to provide our customers with cost-effective service cost-effective service using acceptable methods that ensure professional quality and peace of mind. We understand both our clients' needs and the requirements of authorities. Now, all environmental incidents must be managed in line with Section 28 and Section 30 of NEMA, National Environmental Management Act, and also in conjunction with the Waste Act, Occupational Health and Safety Act, and also the Water Act. So there are four acts that we're using managing all environmental incidents and claims. Our head office is based in Johannesburg. We've currently got three specialist consultants in our team in South Africa, Joburg team. And we do work in South Africa, obviously, and the majority of SADC regions. Currently, we're a little bit hampered with COVID. However, we have made a plan to manage incidents in Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and also DRC. Our local team have collective experience in pollution assessment and remediation field in excess of 60 years. <laughs> okay. Hello. Your mic. Thank you. Okay. Dealing with, amongst others, hydrocarbon and chemical spills in varying amounts from tens of millions of liters, numerous high risk and highly sensitive environmental disasters. Industrial decontamination cleanups and environmental due diligence. We've got 18 different services that we offer to the environmental industry, or not just insurance related claims, but also non insurance related claims. We don't just deal with insurance related claims, we also consult and assess various to various other industries, private sector and also public sector. Environmental pollution assessments is always the first thing that we do for any spill. I did mention it earlier on. Environmental consultation, authority and regulatory compliance and notifications. We do that on behalf of the insured. In this case, it's most probably going to be the transporter who is the polluter. Site assessment and investigation, phase one and two, two different phases of investigation. It's a risk, environmental risk assessment that we conduct for each and every incident. Third party peer review, um, that's a different service that we offer for different insurers as well. They just want to, us to have a quick overview of um, information, costings, reports that they receive from a, a specific uh, service provider. And I just want us to quickly run through it and see if, if the contractor was compliant and also just to have a look at their costs. So we do that, we, we, we also offer that service, which is a third party peer review service, we do a quantification of that claim, scrutinization of the bills and data verification. Um, we do, do then a very short report to give them a bit of background on our views and what is fair and also market related pricing. Emergency planning and response, which is client specific. So if any transport required that service, you also assist them with that specific service in South Africa. Sudden accidental incident management, um, all the claims for roadside emergencies would be sudden accidental. Um, I have never ever in my life had a gradual spill for a roadside emergency. So all incidents that we will manage on behalf of I2 from a roadside point of view will be sudden accidental. Marine oil spill consultation and emergency management, any marine related claim, anything from a container, to a sea container to a spill on a ship or in transit, might it be on the ship itself and on the road? Hazardous material facility claims management, we manage the full claim if there's a, a hazardous material incident. Incident desktop assessments, large claim project management, abatement, which is removal of asbestos and various different other hazardous chemical substances, decontamination of that plant and or facility, remediation management services, gradual incident investigations and management, environmental due diligence and auditing services, soil and groundwater contamination and management. But that comes obviously after our first point, which is environmental pollution claim assessment. Like I said earlier on, we need to first conduct the assessment before 
we can consult on a specific matter. So point number 14 comes after point number one. Point number 15 is indoor air quality assessments, occupational health and hygiene assessment services, aquatic ecological assessment services, and any additional environmental consultancy services that you would require. So most of these services is, is not specifically uh, uh, focused on roadside emergencies. However, any claim in general, which is environmental related or waste management related, we can and have assisted IT with. And then I'd show our services again, incident assessment consultation. This is more from a roadside emergency point of view, cleanup and waste management consultation, HSE compliance, and obviously also your environmental compliance from a notica notification and alert report to environmental affairs. And then we manage the process and the project in general to completion and sign off from environmental affairs. So I just would like to take a step back. So on that specific point, we can't submit any notifications to the Department of Environmental Affairs or Water Affairs and Sanitation um, directly. We need to do it through the insured or the polluter. So they are ultimately responsible. The transporter, the polluter remains responsible in view of legislation. There's various different legislations which I will bring up just, just now, but ultimately the polluter remains liable. Clay management process. So I'm going to quickly run through this. This is the process that we follow on any incident that we manage. Might it be a small incident, anything from a 10 litre, 100 litre, up to 10 million litre incident. You will manage it the same. Obviously, your cost will be higher on a bigger incident. Your size of your incident will be bigger. The volumes of, of waste will be much larger. So everything will be larger, the bigger the incident. But you will manage the process exactly, exactly the same. So. These few points will, will highlight the process that we follow from a, from a loss adjusting point of view. Initial site assessment, information gathering and product containment. So we're making sure that the contractor that goes out there has been audited, skilled, qualified, and also on I2's panel to make sure that we send out the correct person to contain the product that's spilled. Second point, assistance with information notifying the authorities on behalf of the insured. There I mention again, we assist them. We can only support them, but we cannot submit on behalf of the polluter, which is the insured, which in this case is gonna be the transporter. Cleanup and waste management consultation. That goes without saying, we manage the contractor, the management, the waste management process, um, where they're going to dispose. If there's any alternative, we then suggest accordingly. Safety baseline risk assessment of that specific incident. If it's a large incident, we assist the client or the transporter in this regard, if it's required. Provide recommendations on cleanup methods and techniques. Has this chemical waste classification and disposal consultation. So if the specific product that's spilled can be bioremediated, recycled, or reused in any other different industry, we normally look at options to reuse that product. So let's use polypropylene balls, those little polypropylene balls. We had um, incidents like that where we then got a plastic recycler out, they took all the product and we actually got a lot of, um, a lot of money back from the recycling of the plastic that we could actually pay for the cleanup. However, the way that we've managed that is we still pay the contractor for the cleanup and the rebate on the plastic that was, was, was um, generated was then paid back to the insurer. Shared terms and reference for um, the waste management and cleanup methods. This is only with large incidents. Large incidents, we normally uh, share a terms of reference, how the contractor needs to manage the incident and um, through a BOQ process, process, which is a bill of quantity process, which we send out to three or four contractors and they need to then quote us for phase two and three. Now phase one, I'll explain it to you just now, is the containment phase, but phase two and three is the remediation rehabilitation phase. So in larger incidents, we do get quotes and uh, alternative costs from other service providers that's been audited and approved. Health and safety environmental site assessments, that's obviously what we do um, during the process of cleanup. External specialist sourcing and support, if we require any other specialist, aquatic specialist, ecological specialist, any other specialists required, we get them in to assist uh, for the duration of the cleanup. Cleanup contractor management, we manage the contractor from inception to completion, process and project management, cost verification and scrutinization, which is the biggest thing 
that I'm sure all insurers are concerned about. We have a set method that we manage costs. And on our IQs panel, all contractors are audited and they are a set rate structure for each and every type of incident. And that's also written down in strict SOPs, which was done for I2. So these contractors can't move out the perimeters of um, different rates, different methods. There's a set structure set out for these contractors, how to clean up these spills. Project closeout and facilitation, request a site closure letter on behalf of the insured um, from the FFE, Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment. That's the new name. So they're not Department of Environmental Affairs anymore. They're in the better known now as the FFE, just for your information. So there are the three phases that I spoke to you about just now. Phase one, just quickly in a nutshell, I'm not going to read word for word, but in a nutshell, phase one is consisting out of five steps. It's scene stabilization, initial response, containment, sealing of the origin of the spill, and scene, secure, scene safety, making the scene safe, securing the spill, containing it so it doesn't migrate further. So once that is done, and the spill can't affect any further other water sources or the environment, you can then, in, in large incidents, request quotations from other service providers with, from a phase two and a phase three point of view. So only with large incidents, if the local contractor can't manage that incident, sufficiently and cost effectively, we then ask for quotations from other service providers. So phase two is the cleanup phase, which is the remediation phase, is to correct and rem remedy the problem. So might it be washing of hard surfaces, tar roads, concrete surface, might it be excavation, a disposal of soils, might it be bioremediation of soils, that is remedying the problem. So phase three is the site reinstatement and ecological restoration is to restore the environment back to the condition it was prior to the spill or the incident. And then obviously following the process with environmental affairs and signing the site off. Um, that is a very critical thing. Um, from the beginning, from inception, an alert report goes out to environmental affairs here in phase one. You will see I did mention it there. Phase two, we will issue all reports to environmental affairs, but phase three, we need to get final site closure from environmental affairs that they are fully aware and involved throughout the process and they've signed the site off. They were happy with the remediation process. From an environmental assessment point of view, I'm going to just quickly touch on this as well. What we do is we determine the source. So in some cases, we don't know what is the cause or origin of the spill. So a roadside emergency, obviously, if you're carrying 45,000 liters of petrol, and the petrol is flowing downstream, uh, down a river, we obviously know where the source and origin <laughs> is coming from. So, but this is more specific to static incidents. What? In some <laughs> if you use that for open book. <laughs> Hi, Brett. Can you please mute? Thank you. All right. <clears throat> uh, where was I? So from a source point of view, we need to um, ascertain, still ascertain, from an assessment point of view, the volume and origin of the spill, type of release, characteristics of release in the product, and effects of the product on the environment. Pathways, it's gone down a pipe, pipe a line, it's gone into soil, into aquifer, it's gone straight down the river, has it just gone into the uh, soil or into air? So we need to de determine those pathways to establish the risk to, lastly, the receptors. The receptors are the points or people or, or, or aspects that can be impacted by the spill, which is impacts is human health, environment, and most cases, fauna and flora, which is environment in, in the sense of water and plants and also animals. Phase one and two is A, which is basically our environmental risk assessment that we conduct. And then thereafter, we can recommend the remedy phase, which is the, we just go one slide back. That's what we ascertain from phase one, phase two, and then phase three we can effectively consult on the way forward for rem remediation and rehabilitation. From a le legal requirement and responsibility point of view, the polluter pay policy, section 28 and section 30 of NEMA, National Environmental Management Act point of view, there are six parties that can be held liable for any environmental pollution incident. But if it's a roadside emergency, I'm going to quickly run through this with you. I will explain to you which one is applicable from a roadside emergency point of view. So the owner of the land can be held liable. So if it's a static incident, a person in control of the land, if it's a static incident, uh, 
person who occupies and uses the land, owner of and control the substance involved, person who is or was responsible for the incident, person who was directly or indirectly contributed to, to the pollution. Environmental affairs can hold these six parties responsible for the remediation and rehabilitation of that environmental incident. So that makes it even more, more uh, uh, applicable to have insurance as a transporter, transporting dangerous goods. So you will be held liable from environmental affairs point of view, from NEMA point of view, because you were the owner in control of the substance involved. And in some cases, you were also responsible for the incident. So maybe you're not, uh, you're not the owner of the land or person in control of the land. However, these two at the bottom, from a roadside point of view, it was your product. You are the owner of the transport, uh, the transport company. And that means that you, were resp you are responsible in view of NEMA section 28 and 30. So you will be held liable. Responsible, uh, uh, responsibilities of a transporter specifically um, for roadside incidents and or static incident. You ensure from a preparation and contingency point of view that you ensure, make sure you've got comprehensive cover, insurance from an environmental point of view, from your asset point of view, and then also from a GIT point of view. Investigate, assess, and evaluate possible impacts. So do route risk assessment or road risk, route, uh, risk assessments on the paths and, and, and the ways that you normally transport your product. Educate employees, very important. So as a dangerous goods transporter, all your drivers must also have dangerous goods training. So that is very, very, very important. So if they don't have this and they do transport dangerous goods, um, it's illegal not to have the, the training. You won't have a PRDP in any case if you haven't done that training. So if you do have an incident after the black line, if you do have an incident, cease, modify, control if pollution have been um, detected. So obviously if your tanker, you have a tanker rollover and there's a spill, <laughs> there's nothing that you're going to detect. There is definitely a spill. So contain, prevent movement of pollutants. That's phase one, as you can see here at the bottom. Assess, monitor, evaluate, that's still phase one. Eliminate source information and informing authorities. So eliminate and informing authorities, still phase one. And then phase two and three is remedy of the effects. So again, remediation and rehabilitation and restoration of the environment. So this is, these words come exactly as it is out of the National Environmental Management Act, out of section 28. What is the responsibilities of a polluter? So these are the responsibilities of a polluter, but just more in view of a transporter. I tried to put it out this way so that it's a bit more uh, applicable to transporters. Just some photos of previous incidents, uh, transformers exploding at substations, uh, a large oil spill at an industrial fire, another big chemical spill at an industrial property, um, and also another chemical incident there. The photo on the left top, was an oil spill, 100,000 liters oil spill. Seven kilometers of uh, stormwater drains were contaminated, factory chemical factory fires. And here's some just more photos of a stream that was contaminated with diesel. And um, that was about 40,000 liters of diesel that's gone down the stream uh, river. And there's another chemical incident. So from a notification a point of view to notify us or to inform us or request for additional service, you can send an email to environmental special services to environmental sa at efiglobal.com and that email will go to all of us to, to myself to Johan, to alan and to elise which is our pa in our office that can assist so if you do have an emergency send an email alternatively let's just go over to all our contact numbers and um, there's all our contact numbers all our phones are diverted to each other and also if we do work for i2 Obviously, the control room will phone us on our respective phones, um, but Chris Ann will cover that just now from an emergency contact point of view. Um, if you want this presentation, I'm sure I wouldn't have an issue with it, but uh, I'm sure you can ask or request the same from Chris Ann. If there are any questions, speak now or ever hold your peace. I'm going to stop sharing, Shelley and uh, Chris Ann, and you guys can take over. Thank you, Tuan. Um, sorry, we have got a few questions that we would like to pose to you. 90% um, of our claims are hydrocarbon side tank spills. What's the average cost of one of these claims? From an experience point of view, I normally 
categorized and classified into two different sort of categories. You get your, your standard side tank spill, and which is normally small in size, anything from about 10 liters up to about 600 liters, which is the max capacity of a standard two side tanks. Um, you know, the, the smaller spills will range anything from a 10,000 up to 100,000. Anything that uh, touches water or goes into a waterway and or a wetlands. Obviously, the minute it touch water, you can multiply the sum of that cleanup by two or three times it would have, what it would have cost if it just spilled on soil. So yes, unfortunately, any spill that goes into a waterway or water source will be doubled or tripled. Um, then you get your GIT spills. Um, from experience, I've managed various different spills over the past 20 years um, as a contractor and as a consultant and as a loss adjuster. But your, your, your average cost of, of that, um, again, your spill is anything from 1,000 a, a liters to a max of 45,000 liters. And again, it depends on where did it spill? Was there any water involved? What type of product was involved? Um, is it an acid? Is it a very toxic product? Um, and the volume, what volume spill? So there's various different factors that can influence that and affect the cost. But again, that range anything from 100,000, again, up to... Three million. So it's, 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 it, there are so many variances um, that you need to take in consideration. And again, if you don't involve us, get, get yourself and prepare yourself for huge costs. Because if you don't manage a contractor, unfortunately, these guys um, see it as an open check. And if you have been in the insurance industry and you've ever dealt with a spill contractor, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, we recently added right and strike cover as an offering on our policy. Are you seeing increases in these type of claims in the market at the moment? Unfortunately, yes. Last year, there was a spike, um, especially in KZN, Cape Town, and, and along the N3, last year specifically. This year, um, the, the first quarter of this year, there's been a spike as well. And there's no real trend. It's just... You know, when people are unhappy, they, 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 wherever they see trucks, they just stop them and set them alight. <laughs> um, they don't really choose names unless there's a personal agenda, but they just stop trucks and set them alight. So unfortunately, there is. Um, and I'm sure the Road Freight Association, everybody is looking into it, but unfortunately, it's not very, very much we can do about it. Okay. Um, in your presentation, you advised that an owner of a company can be held liable in the event of a spill. What does this include? Is it fines? What, what kind of things are included in a, an owner being held liable? Yeah, um, the National Environmental Management Act is very clear. Um, our environmental laws in South Africa is, is, is really some of the best in the world. Um, if, you, if you do go and, and study it and, and read up about it, it's wonderful. Our environmental laws are wonderful. Um, they're really easy to follow as well. However, it's the, it's the compliance side. It's the legislation um, requires compliance and you need a compliance officers. So, I mean, with regards to monitoring it from that point of view, it's a bit difficult. However, there has been successful uh, uh, um, fines being imposed and also imprisonment for the CEO of companies and as, as per my presentation, section 28 is very clear about it. You as the polluter, might it be that you own a tank, a tanker, 100 tanks, or just one little drum. If you pollute, if you spill, you are liable. And there are six parties that are liable. Environmental Affairs will and can uh, sue you for that and follow the processes. And ultimately, if you have been found liable, you will definitely pay for that plus penalties, plus cleanup costs, plus various legal costs. So as a, as a polluter, let's just give it a minute. There we go. Okay. Thanks, Brian. All right, no worries. So um, you as the polluter will be liable. Then um, that doesn't matter if you've got insurance or not. I mean, uh, in pollution cover doesn't make you not liable. You remain liable in the, in the view of the law and according to a National Environmental Management Act. So if you take responsibility to pay for, for the cleanup or restoration of the environment and then claim back from your insurance if liability is accepted, 
Okay, it's one way of doing it. If you want to inform your insurance, they then appoint us. We look at all the all the if all the steps are followed. Then if you uh, uh, do have an active policy and if that vehicle was specifically on the schedule, that's the process that we need to follow to make sure that we were compliant. And then we react to the contractors and we send them out irrespective. The fact remains is you remain liable as the polluter. Um, and then my last question for you right now is, how do you know if a cleanup contractor has overcharged or inflated their costs on a claim? Is there a way of picking it up? Yeah, there are various ways. So like I said earlier on, I was a contractor myself um, and I know how these guys operate and they like mushrooms. They pop up weekly. <laughs> new um, so I would recommend, and 90% of transporters out there do have uh, uh, registered, approved, audited service providers. It's the smaller guys that you need to be careful of. Three o'clock in the morning and say, hey, but I'm around a corner. I'll do this job for you very cheap, under 10,000. And then tomorrow he sends you a bill of 150,000. So those are the guys that give me headaches because it's difficult um, after the transported or the insurer appointed these guys without following the necessary steps. So um, I can pick it up immediately. So 90% of incidents are normally managed by service providers that's been audited. And luckily all I2 service providers have been audited and they work in line with certain specific SOPs that's been highlighted. They've been given guidelines. They've been given specific rates to work according to. So there can't be any gray areas there. And luckily from an I2 point of view, that's not an issue. But talking in general, your smaller guys out there, they do take chances. I'm, I'm currently dealing with two claims where it was a new service provider and this guy just checked the opportunity and, and for a 200 liter spill, charged 90 bags of absorbance. I mean, you can pick up stuff like that. When you just view the, the invoice, you view the report you can, and the photos, you can clearly see what's going on here. So um, what's to my advantage, I've been a contractor working for the largest hazmat company out there um, years ago. I know exactly how these guys operate. And then um, what we normally do is we go, uh, we, we communicate with them, we meet with them, and we then explain the processes that needed to be followed, was followed, should be followed. And then eventually these guys do lower their invoices to be market related and uh, to be more specific for those size of incidents. Can't hear you, uh, Shelley. Simon Griffiths has asked a question. What is the new regulation pertaining to property owners with the old sawtooth asbestos roofing and contamination? That's a, that's a presentation for another day. I've actually done a presentation yesterday where I covered a lot about asbestos. New asbestos regulations are specific. I mean, since 2008, you weren't allowed to manufacture any asbestos related products, transport, process, or deal with any asbestos related products. So what he's specifically talking about is the removal of old asbestos, which we call the big six plates. So asbestos containing material uh, needs to be removed and by a registered asbestos contractor, anything over. So type one asbestos is um, any asbestos roof or area below 10 squares. And type two is any asbestos over 10 squares. You need to appoint a registered asbestos contractor so anything below 10 squares, you can remove yourself. Anything over 10 squares, you need to appoint a registered asbestos contractor and an AIA, Approved Inspection Authority, which is approved to uh, both approved through the Department of Labor and audited and also approved. They've got a certificate for that. Both of them must have. And then uh, type three is more your raw asbestos work where you deal with high risk asbestos and you get three types of asbestos, blue asbestos, brown asbestos and white asbestos. You need to deal with them all exactly the same. So removing the asbestos roofs, unfortunately, that's quite a complex process. And like I said, it's a presentation on its own. And um, if he wants to, I will send him a write-up that I've done, abbreviated write-up that I've done on the new asbestos regulations. I can send it to him. So if you can just on the on the message, just send me his email address and I'll send him a full write-up on that. Tom now commented to turn around and say that Ace Magashulu is an expert at this. So I've heard. Yeah, and <laughs> the company that was appointed, only one director is alive. The other one was taken out in Joburg, <laughs> apparently. Thanks, Dwayne. I've got um, 
the email address, so I'll pass it on to you. Um, if there's no further questions, then thank you. Thank you so much for being part of the talk today. No problem. Thank you so much, Duane. Um, and it's really important to see that uh, at I2, we follow a fair process during our claims processes. And um, thank you so much for doing that on our behalf. So to tie in um, with what J uh, Duane's just said, let's speak a little bit about the product side. I'm just gonna share my screen quickly again. Can everybody see this? We can. Okay, so on the environmental side, um, uh, the environmental policy is triggered by pollution. So there has to be a pollution condition that has to occur in order for the policy to respond. We often get a lot of queries, for example, saying that where steel's fallen over, steel poles or copper pipes have fallen over, and would we in fact pick that up? So if a commodity just falls over and can be easily picked up um, and put back onto a truck and then driven to wherever it needs to be, this would be this would fall under your GIT cover, specifically debris removal. So there's no harm caused to the environment there. Um, but should there be something like sulfuric acid or maybe fuel that spills over? These substances penetrate the earth and these cause damage to plants or a nearby water stream. And then this will then trigger the policy, the environmental policy. So we've got three products on the environmental side, which is your truck safe, tank safe, and site safe. On the truck safe, we include cover for the transport of hazardous goods. This also includes or extends cover to light delivery vehicles as well as trucks. So even these light delivery vehicles, they may carry those drums at the back or even those flow bins with hazardous goods in them. And this would be under this policy as well. Uh, we also include cover for side tank spills. The side tank, as you can see on the picture on your right, it's the red truck. You'd see the silver tank in between the two tires. So should that tank uh, leak, then we would pick up the claim, uh, the cost claim that up as well under the truck safe. On the tank safe side, we include cover for underground storage tanks and above ground storage tanks, including petrol stations, um, tanks on farms, depots, factories, warehouses, and all of these things. On the site safe side, we cover the more complex sites, which include your mines, the waste landfills, airports, refineries. We also um, look at nuclear medical installations, if you guys uh, need cover for that. So what is actually covered on environmental policy? So under first party claims, we covered the emergency response costs of up to 250,000 rand. So what this entails is the cost to get a response team out to manage the spill and contain it so that it doesn't spread and cause more damage. Then we covered the cleanup costs, which include the remediation and rehabilitation of the land and the restoring of the environment to put it back into the position prior to the pollution condition of here we also include uh, costs to uh, dispose of the contaminated soil into landfills and as well if treatment, if groundwater needs to be treated and to remove all the contamination there as well. Under third party claims, we cover the emergency response costs again, the cleanup costs again, and then we include the legal defense costs. Should our insureds be sued by a third party, we would pick that up under the legal defense costs. Should a third party suffer a loss or a damage, um, a bodily injury, or have no access to their premises or to operate, we would pick, pick up third party claims in relation to that. So a, a scenario that we usually use is a filling station and one of the underground, store, uh, underground tanks is now leaking into the soil, gets into the water stream, 
and then slowly flows and gradually flows down to the farmer down the road. Now the farmer has his stud bull that he's got there, his prize winning stud bull. And now that bull drinks water from his little pond that's now been contaminated with fuel and it falls over. So now this farmer will now claim damages and he will then go in, we'd pay for that stud bull to replace that stud bull, but we'll also go in to clean the groundwater, to clean up the soil and to rehabilitate the entire land. And then to um, also um, pay the, the third party claims to the farmer so that he doesn't uh, suffer any more losses there. Okay, so over the last year or so, you guys would be uh, would see that we've been adding in our right and strike extension, and have lot had a lot of queries if they can now re uh, remove the SASRIA cover off of the GIT or assets policy. So right and strike extension does not replace the SASRIA cover. So this is what it's supposed to be for. So according to SASRIA as it is now. They do not go and pick up the environmental liability or clean up or put the environment back into the position it was. So they'll replace or they'll repair your vehicles or replace your goods in transit and things like that, but they would not clean up the environment. So this is where our right and strike extension. This cover is sublimited to a million rand and it is only for cover within the borders of South Africa. It's important to note that we add this one. And then we're very, very proud to say that we've paid 100% all valid claims to date on the, the environmental side. So we're very excited and very proud of our claims team and uh, very pleased to say that we've done this and this is our business. If we don't pay claims, we wouldn't be in business. So this is an important part for us. So when it comes to emergency spills, we have uh, an, emer an emergency response process. So we've got a call center uh, where you can contact uh, the Spill Safe hotline. These numbers are for, with, uh, for any spills within South Africa and then the international number for any spills outside of South Africa. So what happens here is that we've got stickers. So if you guys need stickers for the trucks for any of your insureds, they, with these contact details on, they can call the emergency numbers and they get through to a call center agent. They have a call sheet that they ask all the relevant questions that need to be answered uh, regarding the spill, where obviously the location, the amount of uh, products spilled and things like that. And then the call center agent that then takes that call sheet and then contacts Duane immediately. And then Duane quickly looks at that call sheet and then makes a decision on which response team to send out, the equipment to send out, and what would be necessary to contain the spill at that point in time, so that everything happens immediately because um, time is of the essence during these spills. And if anybody needs to get into contact with us, this is the environmental team's contact details. We are available to answer any questions, any queries, just let us know. And thank you so much. Are there any questions? Hi, Christine, there is a question. Um, Olga has turned around and asked, can you please turn around and um, elaborate on business interruption cover? Okay, so our business interruption cover is sublimited to 10 million rand or 50% of the claim. So what we cover here is, should a third party uh, suffer, um, uh, so their, their uh, premises cannot be accessed and they lose business due to a poll pollution condition caused by our insured, we will then um, pay these claims to the third party to be able to uh, recoup whatever business they've lost during that time. Thank you. Um, Christy Carr has asked, what is the take up of this cover like? And do people take these risks seriously? Are they aware of the cover? So 
we've not seen a lot of chat because we've, we, we are in an industry where we've got a big competitor and we hold probably about 10% of the market share at the moment, but there is, um, there is a lot of uh, take up. So our competitor holds probably about 70% of the market share. So there is a lot of um, companies out there that take these, this cover, but we need to now as I too to regain and take up uh, most of that market share. So this is what our goal is to now assign. Um, Leta Jakobs has um, a question. I have a client who uses a transporter to deliver the hazardous goods. They reckon they don't require environmental liability cover. But my worry is that they own the product and would be held liable should there be a spill. How would I approach them to take up the cover? So they definitely will be held liable, according to NEMA, as Duane has said. So we do um, offer cover for a contractor for a company that owns the product, but then subcontracts uh, their transport from a third party. Premiums are usually a little bit higher on these uh, sort of scenarios because the insured doesn't know the condition of those trucks and if it would if it's properly serviced and, ma and maintained and things like that. But we do uh, offer cover on that. I think the way in which you can approach him is to say that according to law, he can be held legally liable should his products go if that contractor has to have an accident or his driver is not uh, properly trained and things like that. Okay. Uh, Christy Carr has asked, does a policy cover legal defense costs for regulatory body inquiries or criminal prosecution? So um, we do we do cover the legal defense costs even when there's criminal prosecution, but we have to uh, we have to we have to look at that on a claim by claim basis. Everything is on its own merit, so every claim has to be looked at in its own uh, on its own merit. I don't know if Sipa and Alex want to comment on that from the claim side. Yeah, just to add on, one, on what you said, yeah, you're right. We basically treat it on each case, case by case, and yeah, nothing more than touch wood so far. We haven't had that scenario, but yeah, we hope not to get there. Okay, good. Thank you, Sipa. Um, next question Does your product offer any advantage over that of your competitor? So at the moment, we are very on par with our competitors. They've caught up with all of our <laughs> new offerings. I do have a list of things. It's not very major things. It's just like a five rand premium here and there on the right and strike. Um, on our right and strike extension, we provide uh, uh, cover for third party as well, where our competitors just provide uh, cleanup costs there. Um, there's also something that I've seen recently where competitors are charging um, additional deductibles uh, should they not, should the insured not call the call center uh, during uh, an emergency spot. So there is a few things, but it changes very often. So we're trying to keep a track of that. Okay. Um, next question also from Christy Carr. Would you cover transit of medical waste and who is liable? The company who disposes of it or the original party where it came from? So we can look at the transport of medical waste, but we have to run this past our, our, uh, our reinsurers first. So who would be responsible is the transporter and the people responsible. So all of them can be tied in, should they be uh, a loss on the road. Okay. Uh, next question is from Leta Jacobs again. Um, does a client need a complete, does a client need to complete two separate proposal forms if they transport and also have a storage? Or is there a joint proposal form that they can complete? So we do have a combined proposal form and we can definitely send that to you. It's not up on our uh, website. So if we can get your contact details, we can send you the combined proposal form. 
I think we're still in the process of getting it poppy, uh, uh, getting the poppy act. Olga Fanamaba has asked, do you offer reinstatements? So we haven't actually thought about asking for reinstatements because nobody asked for reinstatements on the environmental side. But we have brought this to our reinsurers and we will discuss this with them as our renewals are now. So we'll try and get that in. Thank you. Right, that looks like that's the questions. Um, I just want to see. Oh. Oh, so, um, there's a question here. Will you cover environmental damage to own property? Um, so that would be more on a static side. So on our static policies, if there is a claim from the insured for uh, any environmental spills from the insured themselves, that would not be covered. It has to be triggered by a third party claim. Okay. Um, and then Seho asked, I'm not sure if it was covered because they lost con connection, but is there a particular reason for SASRIA not covering enviro damage due to riot and strike? So we're not sure about that, but we've had scenarios in the last two years where SASRIA has come back and said, but we're not cleaning up the enviro. So this is why we've now added in our extension as an extension to that, to be able to cover the environment, because it is important to clean this stuff up. That's all the questions that I have on the panel at the moment. Is there anything else? Tobe, do you guys have anything on Teams side? Any questions on Teams? All good, us actually. Yeah. Thank you. And if I can just ask Dwayne one final question, and that is what's the most expensive cleanup that you've ever had to do? Again, like I said earlier on, that depends on the size, the volume, the location. So that it's spilled down a river, dam, ocean, down a channel, down a road, into soil, sand, irrespective. So, and what type of spill is it? So, is it, is it a sulfuric acid? Is it a hydrofluoric acid? Is it HFO? Because that depends on the remediation and the cleanup methods. Is it a highly toxic product um, like cyanide? So, it depends on various different things. So, I would say the most expensive one from a hydrocarbon point of view. So, hydrocarbons is your diesel oil petrol. Um, I've done the most expensive one was 1.8 million. And that did go into a, a nearby river. Um, then from a cyanide point of view, acid and cyanide, that was about 3.4 million. Uh, 3.4 million rand um, spill that I've done a couple of years ago. But again, you need to take everything in consideration. You can't have the same cover for diesel versus cyanide, um, arsenic products that you're transporting because it's a different product. It's got different risks um, and again, it depends on where did it spill, the volume, the type of product, did it go in contact with water? So there's various environmental factors that you need to consider as well. Uh, Fiona Thompson asks, what about a milk spill? Milk spill, and that's that, and orange juice, and I've had so many requests with regards to milk. But, but milk itself, um, it's a non-hazardous product, and it's wonderful, and it's great when it's in your fridge, but take a bottle of milk, a two-liter bottle of milk, Pour it out in your car, leave your car out in the sun and see what happens two days later. You will not be able to drive that car. You won't be able to live in that right, car. So the problem is with dairy products, um, it contains bacteria, live bacteria, and it goes off and that's what's creating that stench and it becomes acidic as well. So it's not good because of the concentration of milk in one specific area. It starts rotting and it kills all the microorganisms and soil as well and it will kill that patch of grass. Where it's spilled. So you need to clean it up. It's not as expensive, obviously, as diesel, petrol, oil, chemicals, and um, high toxic um, high toxic products like um, as is chemical substances, but you still need to clean it up. Um, we once had a claim where, um, uh, and you wouldn't think it would be as bad as what it was, but it was Vaseline. A, a truck fell over with Vaseline in it, and it took days to clean up the highway. People would think, oh, well, do we really need cover for that? It's Vaseline. It's not a, as if it's a toxic product. 
Well, you're not allowed to let anything or discharge anything else than uh, rainwater down stormwater. So if you get Vaseline down your stormwater, that, that's going to uh, affect the environment and uh, microorganisms, macroorganisms, and, and environment in general. So, I mean, another big issue of, of Vaseline is made from petroleum jelly. So you need to clean it up. Um, it's also very slippery. So if you leave your roads open, you're going to have a slipping and sliding going on there and you will be held liable for all the consequential losses due to your Vaseline spill. So you need to clean it up. And if you do use absorbents, you're going to use a lot more because you need to apply, scrub it in, pick it up, apply again. So you need to use about three or four layers of, of, um, of absorbents. But the best thing working for Vaseline is actually soil, believe it or not, or sand. Oh, wow. Because you need to coagulate it, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. I have no further questions. I don't know, Chrisanne, if you have anything on your side? No, nothing else. Everything looks good. Thank you guys so much for your time during our uh, Tuesday today and for all the questions. And we'll see you again next week. Okay? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm sorry, I'm not going to put my video on. I'm sharing on Teams as well, just so I don't break anything on that side. But thank you to everybody that's attended this iTuesday session. Um, just to touch on a question that Chrisanne answered, um, what is our big differentiator? Um, I think we've got the best claims team and everybody takes, <laughs> takes out cover so that they can have a best claims experience. And if there's nothing else, just think of our claims team um, and how your, your client would experience um, insurance at a claims, at a claims stage. Um, but other than that, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Dwayne, for joining us and for sharing your insights. Thanks, Chris and thanks, Shelley. And we will share that um, asbestos article with everybody that's on the call today. Thank you. And people have thanks, asked for the presentation as well, please, Tova. Okay, we'll do. We'll send it out to everyone. And remember, guys, thank you, guys. your CPD certificates will be available on AC Develop. If you're still not sure how to um, go to AC Develop and get download your certificates, you're most welcome to send me an email. But thank you.